It's Tuesday and welcome to The One Show live on BBC One and iPlayer with Lauren Laverne. Hello. And Jermaine Jean. There's loads on the menu tonight, including superstar chef Jamie Oliver, who's here to launch this year's Good School Food Awards. This is where we celebrate the champions of our school kitchens who are bringing excellent food to our children every day. Look at that. More on that in just a moment. Uh, now, two people who know all about eating well, our husband and wife team, Dr. Michael Mosley and Dr. Claire Bailey. Uh, now, they've combined their talents to tell us how to eat well, sleep better and live longer. Sounds good to me. Oh, yeah, me too. Talking of talent, earlier today, the final stage of judging in the UK's biggest children's writing competition, 500 Words, kicked off. Nearly 44,000 children sent in their stories. And today, the panel of judges, including Seleni Henry, gathered at Buckingham Palace to go through the 50 finalists. Uh, Ramesh Ranganathan will be hosting the 500 word awards ceremony later uh, this month where those lucky finalists get to go to the palace and meet Her Majesty Queen Camilla. Uh, he'll be here to tell us about that and his new stand-up tour. And he's not the only stand-up on the show because we have a really powerful film with comedian Chris McCausland. Now he's been drawing on his own experience as he meets the people who've suffered abuse because of their visible differences and finds out what can be done to shatter the stigma. Uh, right, so we've got lots coming up and as always we'd like you to get involved. If you've got a question for any of tonight's guests or a comment on the show, then please get in touch in all the usual ways. Yes, but we kick off tonight with the hunt for heroes, school food heroes to be exact. Yes, Jamie Oliver is waiting in the wings, ready to launch this year's Good School Food Awards. But first, let's see what happened when he cooked up something special with last year's winners. Last year on The One Show, I launched the Good School Food Awards. Do you love your school food? Yeah! Championing the unsung heroes from cooks. What you've done for the school is quite amazing. I didn't expect this one bit. I didn't expect this. I've just been blown away. To head teachers. Surprise! Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and food educators. That is yours. Thank you. <laughs> whose passion for healthy food has transformed school dinners across the UK. I have this amazing award. Yay! Today, I'm rustling up a meal for champions. I'm going to be doing my take on some fantastic school dinners. Fish pie, spaghetti meatballs, mac and cheese, made with loads of love and care. And I'm getting in the winners of last year's awards in for lunch to celebrate all of their achievements. But not only that, we are going to kick off the search for this year's winners. And I'm pulling out all the stops. Yeah. Chef Steve Bannum won the One Show's Rising Star Award. He impressed the judges with his after-school cooking classes and his lunchtime menu using fresh fruit and veg from the school allotment. Since then, he's been educating the staff and pupils about the importance of nutritious food. Well, how amazing did it feel to get that award last year? It's absolutely fantastic. I've got to deliver more for the children because I've like set the bar, so we've got to go even higher. He's, um, he's our own celebrity chef now. We've got an, an expansion plan for the allotment because he's always looking for new ingredients. The children will pick it and bring it to the back door and then I'll prep it and then they'll have it that same afternoon. Steve's now already involved in developing our food technology curriculum. So you're working not just on the school food, but now on the education side yeah, yeah, yeah. and up in the game. That's brilliant. You've got a double whammy here. <laughs> <laughs> These awards are about recognising incredible people like Steve who are making a difference to our children's health. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you for being a shining light of what good looks like. And now, it's time to eat! As everyone tucks into their lunch, it's a chance for me to find out what our food heroes have been up to since winning. How's the year been? Uh, it's been manic, to be honest with you. Lots of food teachers have been kind of in contact, asking what we do and how we do things um, and how we do such good outcomes in such a short one hour. How do you feel about your teacher winning a national award? I think she deserves it. Yeah. Very good. Proud of her. How important do you think these awards are for amplifying and sharing what great looks like? Absolutely important just to see that that profile can be raised across the country. It's about that recognition of everybody's hard work. We are very thankful to have her as our head teacher because she actually really thinks about our health and about um, how we need to get our nutritional lunch and food. Most importantly, <laughs> what is your favourite school meal? Lasagna. Thankfully we got the Italians in today so that's good. <laughs> Thank you. 
these guys are proof of what can be done to improve our relationship with food. But there's still loads more to be done, and that's why we're here doing it all again, with a little help from some celeb judges. I'm really excited because you've got your own award this year. So it's the Joe Wicks Food for Fuel Award. Yeah. I'm looking for someone this year who is really, you know, championing not just the food and nutrition side of things, but also movement, activity, exercise. Oh, you're making me feel like a good for you. What's going on? <laughs> Sit down, my guy. So, Steve, we're here to celebrate you being the winner last year, but me and Mary have a job because we need to find the new you for this year. Mary, what will you be looking for? We'll be looking for a chef that is putting his or her whole heart and soul into the business of getting children to know where their food comes from and enjoying it and taking part. He's set the standards pretty high. You have set the standards <laughs> so high. Delicious, nutritious school food makes such a difference to children's health, education and so much more. I know there's more inspirational school food heroes out there, so what are you waiting for? Get nominating! <laughs> Oh, for goodness sake, I'm starving now. <laughs> Here to tell us more about the Jamie Oliver Good School Food Awards is the man himself. Hello, Jamie. We got the award. We yes. got the award. He's here. He's in the building. So welcome, Jamie. Welcome. Lovely welcome. to be here. Welcome. What was it like for you meeting up with last year's winners? You must have been so proud. It's always gold. You know, like real people doing really important things on the front line. You know, we're talking about, you know, when it comes to school food, it's over 100,000 cooks out there mm -hmm. feeding our kids every single day. You know, it's a big operation, 26,000 schools, you know, 9 million odd kids, yeah. you know, nearly a quarter of those on free school lunches. It's really important. And this, this opportunity that we have 190 days of the year to do something positive for breakfast and lunch yeah. is immense. It's, it's like this incredible thing. So the School Food Awards, and thank you for all your support, by the way, um, is about celebrating all that is good about this industry this world so ed food educators uh, teachers you know cooks teams so uh, yeah and when you show what good is uh, hopefully parents uh, and students and teachers around the country go right i want a bit of this and and it is theirs to have yeah it's so inspiring and there's this new award that we saw in the film just there this uh, joe wicks food for yeah. fuel award tell us a little bit about that well, I've known Joe quite a while now, and uh, he's such an amazing uh, man, and, and he's done such a lot for kids in schools, PE, of course. Um, and look, uh, he was, I think, going to do his own thing, and I said, look, just jump on this, let's do it together, and let's, let's unify. So he's doing anything to do with energy in, energy out, getting schools going, and whoever wins it, he's going to go to the school and get them all doing press-ups <laughs> and whatever, yeah. you know. But uh, he's a lovely boy, and I think, you know, we need that energy and enthusiasm, and, and I'm, I've been blessed. I've got some amazing judges helping Proof, obviously Mary Berry is gold, mm. uh, amongst many others. Yeah. Um, like, you know, it's all about getting people to support, you know, teachers, uh, food educators, mm. and, and getting kids excited about food. Look, as here at the One Show, Jay, we, we are really looking looking forward to getting involved again with the Rising Star Awards. You're a judge. I am a judge yeah. indeed. He's a good cook. I can't Jay wait. Good you know, I love me cooking. I'm, I, yeah, I'm always trying to pick his brain. I'm always on his stuff, kind of going, what do I do with this? Uh, but yeah, can't wait to get involved. Um, we just saw a clip there of Steve, who won last year. I mean, he's set the bar high, hasn't he? Like, what, what are you looking for this year to, you know, to, to top that, I suppose? Oh, so look, these, these, these men and women that cook for schools are incredible. Like what they do, they often haven't got loads of resource, loads of bodies to do stuff. They create incredible menus that is nourishing and delicious for hundreds, if not thousands of kids. Like what these kids do would make most chefs cry. They have 45 minutes to feed hundreds or thousands. Yeah. So we're looking for, these people that are working at Steve's level, they're problem solvers, they're going beyond the job. They can see how powerful this is for kids. So I wanna find it, obviously I wanna see a kitchen that's full of great food and choice and being clever with budgets and food and machinery and, and, and local help. Um, so yeah, I, I, if you know, if you have an incredible school food service, a great cook, a great team, a great food educator, of course, these yeah. awards are about that. We want to find them. The judges will vet them. <laughs> and, then, and then, you know, we get to give them an award, make them feel special, give Correct. them love, shine a light on them. And 
We, we know that makes a difference. It does, yeah. yeah. They'll be in the spotlight too because the winner's going to be doing some cooking on the morning live set. Yes. No okay. pressure. No okay. pressure. Um, so apart from JJ, as you said, you have got some uh, other famous faces helping yeah. you. Um, you've got Dame Mary Berry, she's back. Dame Prue Leith, McFly's Danny Jones. I mean, really great to have their support on this subject, isn't it? It is. Uh, we want an array of people to, to help us judge what great looks like and what is special. Uh, the support has been amazing uh, and we're getting continued support from people from all kinds of backgrounds. So um, I feel blessed for that. And I think um, everyone seems to be really passionate about arming our kids in the brain and the tummies about food, where it comes from, how it affects their bodies. We have 190 days of the, if you think about it, from the age of four to 16, the government is responsible for yeah. half a kid's nutrition, give or take, right? So this is an opportunity, not a problem. And, you know, even with stuff coming up with elections in the future, who knows, hopefully child health yeah. will become more central. Thank you very much, James. Brilliant. Can't wait to get involved. Uh, now, the all-important bit. Uh, if you want to nominate a school for the Rising Star Award, then head straight to our website where the terms and privacy notice are available. Nominations close just before midnight on the 24th of March. So exciting. Still to come tonight, we're going to be talking to comedian Ramesh Ranganathan about his new tour. Yes, but first, we have not one, but two doctors in the house. Please welcome Dr Michael Mosley and Dr Claire Bailey. Hi, guys. Hello. 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 Claire. Well, Lots of health along. on the show I today. Know. What a healthy Hello. sofa we've got. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah. um, guys, you're both very successful in your fields. You're best-selling best authors, been together for 42 years, but you're about to enter a new chapter, doing something you've never done before. Michael, what is it? Yeah, we're doing a uh, talking tour of the UK. So uh, that's going to be scary because it is um, 17 theatres in 20 nights. So it's going to be really intense and it starts on Monday. <laughs> so that's going to be <laughs> brilliant. And uh, yeah, Claire, I think, is feeling a little... Are you feeling more nervous than um, I am? We, yeah. we did some yeah. bad medical reviews in the past. It's yeah. <laughs> got to be better than that. So we met at medical school uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we used to see Michael uh, on screen a lot more than yourself, Claire. So how, how has he managed to kind of persuade you into the spotlight? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. It just kind of happened by gentle persuasion. And, and that, anyway, so I'm very excited. Yeah, doing exactly. It. A fate to complete. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you guys always tackle the big subject together. And Michael, one of your areas of expertise is sleep. This is a subject that just gets everyone going, yeah. isn't it? What is the most asked question? Well, uh, how do I get a bed night's sleep? Because so many people are chronically knackered. And that's something I'm going to be dealing with in the tour on the show. And uh, I recently have just written a book called Four Weeks to Better Sleep because to address that exactly. And it's based on a large clinical trial that I was involved in last year at a leading sleep centre where we took 30 people who all suffer from chronic insomnia. Including you, right? Including me. And wow. they'd been insomniacs for 20, 30 years. And the goal was to try and sort them out in a few weeks, mm -hmm. which I'm pleased to say most of them we did. Fantastic. That is, that is, yeah, very, very interesting. Wow. I need a bit. You need that with your early mornings. I know that. <laughs> um, so these, uh, it's about nutrition as well. So you're going to be cooking on stage. I... Um, an air fryer, apparently, you're going to be... Uh, yes, yeah. we've just, we're a bit kind of slow getting into air fryers. It seemed a bit kind of faffy somehow. But now we kind of use it almost just... It's good for a couple of people. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we're going to do some air frying on, sh on the stage, which is going to be interesting. You never know how that's going to work out. You ever um, done air frying on the stage? Yeah, well, they're um, efficient. They're efficient. Uh, apparently 75% of the country has them now. Yeah. So it's super relevant, isn't it, at the end and of the day? And it's kind of, you know... Instant, and then just one hand. There's something about one <laughs> hand. <laughs> Brilliant. And Claire's going to be doing treats and all sorts of things. And um, so, so cooking uh, in the yeah. microwave as well. We're going to make high-protein bread in two minutes in the microwave. Oh, wow. Oh. Fun. It doesn't always That's work. Fast. This is a bit of jeopardy. <laughs> it sounds yeah. like you guys do it everything together because yeah. I think exercise is a kind of couple's pursuit for you as well. What yeah. does it what does it do for your relationship to exercise together? <laughs> so we do this sort of seven minute workout in the mornings and you do effectively twelve different exercises and you do it in seven minutes and we do it together because we've sort of linked it, if you like, if to I getting I out go, of bed. No, nah, not today. He'll say, Go on, let's do it. Absolutely. Beyond the age of thirty, unless you do resistance exercise. Uh, then you basically start to lose about 5% of your muscle mass for every decade that goes past. Mm -hmm. So it's press-ups and squats. And I have to say, I've got Claire up from one press-up uh, to how much is it at the moment? 20. Woohoo! So I you did that, that, Michael, to be clear. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, to right. me, I'm just thinking, like, who's doing the press-ups here? Yeah, quite. Uh, I, I can still do 30. Apparently, that'll get me into the Australian army. Just checking. <laughs> can you train with your partner? 
We do, we do. We yeah. have parties together now and again. I just don't work in my house for some reason. I think I'm too pushy. I'm just like, do it, go on. You can lift it. The like, professional no. sportsman. It is, I think here. I'm a bit yeah. too pushy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much. Um, Pleasure. Michael and Claire's tour starts next Monday in Stafford and tickets are available now. Uh, right, still to come, Ramesh Ranganathan will be telling us about his new stand-up tour. But first, we have a really thought-provoking film fronted by fellow comedian Chris McCausland. Now, on stage, Chris often jokes about other people's judgments of him as a blind comic, but tonight he meets those for whom other people's attitudes are no laughing matter. I've experienced everything from people literally crossing the street, running away, staring, making comments. The most common reaction I get from people is they think that I've perhaps smudged my makeup or there's mud on my face. I really didn't want to go outside. I started seeing people look at me. As a stand-up comedian who is blind, I know a thing or two about making a joke about being different. Being blind, my problem is the getting on the stage. <laughs> and the getting off the stage. The being here, I'm fine. It's just the getting here and the getting off that's the problem. So the BBC tour, let's make him do that three times. <laughs> but today I'm going to meet some people who say their appearance has led to them being stared at, verbally abused or even harassed. Visible differences are scars, marks or a medical condition that make you look different. And according to the charity Changing Faces, a third of people with visible differences have been a victim of hate crime, with almost a half being stared at or bullied, something Catherine knows only too well. I have paralysis, so it's frozen on the left-hand side of my face. I can't smile, I can't expression, I have no feeling. Right. Sometimes people don't know if you're learning to fish it, mm -hmm. so they might talk to your partner instead of talking to you. It's a typical kind of blind trope as well, you know, does he take milk in his coffee? Well, ask him, he's, 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 no, he's not deaf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that uh, people with visible differences say that they experience quite often is, is hate crime. What's your own experience of that? A gentleman exposed himself to me on a bus, so that in itself is a crime. But to be turned around by other members of the public I said, you should count yourself grateful. Mm. That is when we're into the realm of hate crime. Gary has had to come to terms with his visible difference more recently. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with a cancerous tumour in my upper jaw here. And what's been your experience of, you know, living with this difference now? It's been extremely difficult. I think the first problem I had was uh, accepting that the person in the mirror was me. I couldn't accept that. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, have some quite severe panic attacks. Yeah. I thought my wife was going to leave me. Um, but she said, uh, she looked into my eyes and saw the same person she married 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's how we should treat um, everyone else. Katie was born with a birthmark on her face. She says more needs to be done to improve how people like her are portrayed on screen. I haven't seen anyone in a positive light on television with a visible difference, but a lot of movies and, and TV have villainous people that have scars. It seems to be that when, when characters are created to highlight a, um, a certain you know, difference or disability, that that has to be what the focus of the whole story is. Yeah, so let's have a character who has a scar on their face, but that's nothing to do with the plot. They're not defined by that scar on their face. Today, Changing Faces has brought together people with visible differences who have experienced stigma around their appearance to offer support and share their stories. I think it's about general public realising that people with visible differences are normal people living normal lives, doing normal things. Do you find that for yourselves, being able to meet other people who have also got visible differences is helpful for, for you? Absolutely. Meeting these guys have been really, really powerful and really helpful. It is really good to meet other people who have a visible difference. What I didn't realise was I'd actually find it quite cathartic. It's shocking to hear what some of the people I've spoken to today go through on a daily basis. But hopefully, as more people talk about their experiences, 
it will lead to more understanding and ultimately to greater acceptance and respect. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah brilliant. thank you so much, Chris. And it's time now to welcome our next guest. It's Ramesh Ranganathan. Ramesh, thank right. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, Rom, I know that Chris is someone you know really well. He's a good mate, yeah. You are also a believer in celebrating differences. You've talked about that in your stand-up, and it also came up in uh, your kids' book that you wrote. So this subject is one that strikes a chord for you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I've had it to a slightly lesser degree, having like a lazy eye and stuff. It, you know, it's not to the same degree, but it, it, it does affect... I feel like, you know, watching that, it's the way that people interact with you is slightly clouded by what they're seeing. Do you know what I mean? And you want them to see beyond that. And, and, and some people don't. And, it's, and I don't think you can necessarily blame people, but the same, you know, if it's, you know, sometimes it's accidental. But I really do feel strongly that getting, making people feel like that is, a, that is a difference that you can celebrate rather than be sort of so, yeah. feel horrible about, I think mm -hmm. is a really important thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, absolutely. Thanks, uh, right, let's talk about your stand-up tour, mm. shall we? Um, now, comedians, they obviously like to use, like, personal material, don't they, kind of, in their stand-up. But this is something that's... Uh, got you into a little bit of hot water at home I hear yeah it's an issue well I mean, the, the issue is twofold one <laughs> is that I'm really honest on stage and two Lisa my wife doesn't watch anything I do so she finds <laughs> out about it later on <laughs> so I had this thing where I was talking about doing the school run and I was talking about um, talking to parents telling me about their children and I just said off the cuff you know I don't care about your children you know like, like, like I'm biologically hardwired to care about mine and yours are, 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 are I don't mean in a bad way I'm sure they're wonderful but I personally have, don't have an interest <laughs> and then, and then, um, we were at this kid's birthday party and these parents came up and they said we would tell you what ours have been up to but you don't care do you I mean, and, and Lisa hadn't seen me do that so she just looked at me she goes one of your other jokes, <laughs> another one of your clever things that you said on TV, was it? Well done, Ron. And did you know what it was that you, because, you know... I you, knew straight away. As, as soon as they approached, I saw... Okay. I saw <laughs> I got, yeah. the other, I mean, another time I got into trouble was so I was doing a show, Taskmaster, mm -hmm. and you have to choose things, like, you ha we had to select prizes that we'd lose if we, if we didn't win the show. And they said, bring in your worst present you've ever received. And I just forget it's being televised. So I brought in... Um, this snow globe that my sister-in-law got me, which is like, she'd sort of done this Christmas snow globe and she'd sort of photoshopped Santa hats onto me and the kids and gave it to me. And I brought it into the show and I said, this is like trash. Uh, anyway, I didn't know Taskmaster was going to be that big. I had no idea. I was on the first series. I mean, like, the next time they came round, they went, you said you like that globe? Yeah. I was like, oh, mate. They gave me another globe the following Christmas yeah. to pretend Every they were joking, now. but That's I could it. tell it hurt. Yeah, annual globe from yeah. yeah. now on. So the new tour is called Hustle. I mean, Ramesh, you are the hardest working man in comedy, I think. So is that the inspiration for the title? It, well, it's kind of, I, I, I'll be honest with you, it's sort of a bit of a contradiction. I mean, I, I, the, the hustle thing is a bit of my kind of, the show's sort of me looking at the fact that we're all being pushed into this grind culture of like, every day you've got to work as hard as you possibly can. How are you going to smash today and stuff like that? And people have said to me like, you, you like, arguably you hustle, but I don't feel like I work hard. I, I feel like I work a lot. It's a difference. I don't, I don't find my job hard. I love what I do. I'm lucky enough to 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 love what I do. So I can't think of the last time I dreaded going into work. I don't like being away from home, mm. but I feel like I love my work. But it's, I feel like we don't have to be smashing every day. We don't have to be pushing the envelope every single day. It's okay to just get through it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so the show's kind of a statement on that. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm not making it sound that funny, but, but, <laughs> but, it, but it, trust me, I deliver it in a really delightful way and it's a sideways glance at life that I think everyone could enjoy. <laughs> it's always funny, Rob. It's always funny. All right, uh, Robich's tour, Hustle, continues tomorrow and tickets are available right now. Go and get them. Now, while you're here, Robich, we've got to talk about 500 words. So this is the BBC's short story competition for kids aged 5 to 11 and the judges gathered to date booking in Palace to start their deliberations. Some brilliant people involved. There's Seleni Henry, Frank Cottrell Boyce, Charlie Higson and Francesca Simon. And it's all geared up for this grand final event where the 50 finalists will get to go to Buckingham Palace and meet Queen Camilla. Mm. And you are going to be hosting the whole event. How excited are you? I'm very excited. I, I, it's a combination of excitement and nerves because, you know, obviously... Um, 
I, I want to, I'm going to be on best behaviour. Like, you know, there's certain things I won't be doing, like I won't be using the toilet while I'm there. Just, I just think it's just better to sort of minimise any issues. Do you know what I mean? I, I, and so <laughs> I, I'm just trying to maintain some sort of level of decorum and be, uh, you know, operating at top notch, you know. Do you not feel like that could work out really, really badly if you time it wrong? I think I will make preparations to avoid okay, any good. embarrassment. Sounds like a wow. little story coming to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're going to be joined uh, by some famous faces who will have the task of reading, reading out some of the winning stories. Um, and you can actually reveal now, can't you, the, uh, the first two celebrities that are going to be yes, doing that? Yes, the first two celebrities are Hugh Bonneville and Oti Mabuse. Oh, oh, very nice. Very exciting, yeah. I mean, these two so exciting. And look at this, this is what Oti had to say. Hi everyone, it's Oti Mabuse here and I cannot wait to join you at the 500 words final where I will be announcing one of the awesome winning stories. See you there! And you can watch the whole event on a special one show that's going to be out on World Book Day, March the 7th and on BBC Breakfast that same morning you'll get to see more of the judging that's taken place today. Now, um, Jamie, as somebody, you, you spoke about dyslexia for a, a while. Um, You've written many books, uh, you know, over the years. How, how important do you think it is, like, competitions like this exist? Really, really important. I think, like, my kids all took part in 500 Words. Oh, and brilliant. I think it's nice, it's, like, it's exciting. And it's great that everyone gets behind it. Uh, for me, as a dyslexic kid, that w I, I would have never have done it, right? Because it, it just felt, it, words were my enemy, for sure. And, yeah. and the whole idea of reading was a bit of a nightmare. But I think, you know, things have moved on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's more help now. And certainly, for me, like, things like audiobooks have been really, really powerful. And certainly when I did my kids' book, I wanted to sort of make it as immersive as possible and make, you know, get things flying around the place, sound effects, music, you know, different actors. Yeah. So for me, that would have kept my attention. Mm. Um, but look, there's so much that can be done now. And I think the important thing is that everyone can write. And if you struggle to actually physically write, you can use dictaphones like I did. You can use stickies and build up narratives and characters. You can get help from people. Because yeah. I, I think ultimately, if you've got any kind of neurodiversity, it's about how did you learn to problem solve? Yeah. Anyone can do anything. Yeah. You just got, you know, and yeah. people often say, what do these people do in your office? And I say, they do all the things I'm really bad at. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot. <laughs> so, I, I think that's a good thing about this competition because I feel like, you know, you know what Jamie's talking about, being a kid and feeling like creative writing is something that's not for you yeah this is like a no barriers competition it's not about spelling it's not about grammar it's not about punctuation it's about just creative writing and it's and i feel like you know we're trying to tackle the issue of like some kids may think that creative writing is not for them because they've struggled with those elements it's not about that it's just about coming up with a great piece of writing a great story something you'd want to read yourself yeah. and submitting it so it's yeah, uh, i beautiful. feel like it's a really positive Love thing that. thank yeah. you uh, to you both been great thank you very much alex and rona will be here tomorrow with